Turn with us tonight, if you will, to the book of Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And I want to share with you tonight, uh, I trust something that will be a challenge to your heart and most of my preaching is addressed to the individual and uh, what I'm going to preach tonight is going to be mostly addressed to the church and uh, there can be an individual application made of it because we that are individuals make up the church and uh, I trust that the Lord will speak to our hearts tonight from his word. I want to bow for a moment of prayer and then we're going to read from Numbers chapter 14 and we'll begin in, in verse 1 just after we pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege again to open your precious word and I pray as we look into your word tonight that your word will speak to our hearts. And Lord, that your word will challenge our hearts and motivate our hearts to be all that we need to be for the glory of God. I thank you, Lord, for this past year and the blessings that have been ours to enjoy. And I pray here on this last Sunday of the year of 1991 that you'll challenge our hearts in a special way. Lord, that we might not settle for anything less than that that you've bought and paid for and given unto us. Help us, Lord, to be willing to possess what rightfully belongs to us. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for all that is accomplished because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of Numbers, chapter 14, in chapter 13 is where Moses sent out the spies at the directions of the Lord to spy out the land of Canaan. These spies went into the land of Canaan to <clears throat> investigate the land, to bring mm -hmm. back samples of the fruit of the land. And uh, they spent 40 days investigating the land of Canaan, the land that God had called them to. And when they came back, Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report, told them about the land, being a land of plenty, a land that flows with milk and honey. And, uh, but they were outnumbered. Ten of the spies uh, came back and brought up a, an evil report. They saw the uh, Anakims there, the giants there. And they compared themselves in verse 33. They said, There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. So they brought back a, a port of really unbelief and, uh, and really opposed the report that Joshua and Caleb had brought back about the land. Verse number 1 of chapter 14, the Bible said, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey were it not better for us to return unto Egypt and they said one to another let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephne which were of them that searched the land rent their clothes they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. We're going to stop there in verse number 11. And uh, these verses concerning the unbelief and uh, the way that they had rebelled against what was God's will for their lives. Look back with me in verse number 4. The Bible said, they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Let us return into Egypt. I said I want to speak tonight primarily to the church. I almost got off on my message tonight, this morning, a time or two in, in preaching when I preached about this morning the subject of loving Jesus. But I want to share with you tonight three practical reasons why that I believe they come to the conclusion they wanted to go back. They said, let us make us a captain and let us return into Egypt. We're living in days when it seems like that the devil does all he can to break the will of Christian people, to discourage them and to defeat them. And even many of them, he, he brings them to the place that they think the solution to all their problems is going back. But I want to say to you tonight, there is no future in going back as a Christian. There's only one direction for the Christian, and that's going on. Going on. And uh, I believe that, that uh, if there's anything tonight that we as God's people in these last days in which we're living in, and I truly believe we are living in the last days, that we ought to pray for the grace of God to give us determination to just keep on keeping on and to keep going on and never come to the place that we will even contemplate going back and returning. Why, after all that God had done for these people, why would they come to the conclusion they would be better off going back? Notice what the Lord said about them in verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Do you know that in the story that we have before us tonight, if you read the history of the children of Israel from the time they left the land of Egypt, until the time they arrived at this place of decision that God had wrought one miracle right after another and that God had done great and mighty things in their midst of which all of them were witnesses of what God had done. And now, as strange as it may seem, they had come to the place that they wanted to go back and they come to the place that they said, why? We would have been better off if we had died in Egypt. We would have been better off to have even died in this wilderness rather than we go over in the land of Canaan and become a prey and our children become a prey to the Canaanites and to the enemies there in the land. And I, I can't for the life of me understand people that go back and return and uh, go back to, to an old life after all that God has done for them. But I, I want to speak tonight, as I said, to the church. And we as a church, one of the most dangerous tendencies that we have is to become lax and become comfortable with where we are. That is a danger for any church. Just like I preached this morning about uh, loving Jesus and that first love and, and uh, how that Jesus... Uh, spoke to the church at Ephesus and said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. In other words, you don't love me the way that you used to love me, the Lord said. And so I want to I wanna just share with you tonight three things, simple things, that I believe is behind this decision that they made to go back. Let us return 
into Egypt. First of all, I want to say I believe they got over it. Secondly, they got used to it. And in the third place, they forgot it. They got over it, they got used to it, and they forgot it. Now, let's, let's take these three things and apply them to this situation. First of all, they got over it. What did they get over? Well, think about it. For 430 years, the children of Israel was in Egyptian bondage, and they were under the taskmakers of Pharaoh, and they were in slavery and in bondage to those Egyptians. And they cried and prayed and said, Oh God, if you could just hear us, and if, if somehow, God, you could just deliver us out of this bondage and out of this oppression that we're under. And I imagine in those 430 years, there were times that they thought God surely had forsaken them and that God would never hear their cry and their prayer. Because for 430 years, they were in that bondage and in that slavery. But did you know that the Bible says that one day God spoke to a man by the name of Moses and he said, I have heard the cry of my people and I have seen their afflictions and I'm going to send you down to Pharaoh and I'm going to send you down to deliver my people out of that Egyptian bondage. And so after 430 years of slavery and bondage, God heard their cry. God saw their afflictions and God sent a man by the name of Moses down to the children of Israel and delivered them out of that Egyptian bondage. Now you think about what a time it was. You know the story and for the sake of time I won't cover all the details. But to make a long story short, God came to the place that he told Moses and gave him instructions as to what the children of Israel was to do about taking the blood of that lamb and putting it upon the doorpost and so forth. And he said, uh, at midnight, the death angel is going to come through the land. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And on that night of deliverance, God delivered the children of Israel out of that Egyptian bondage. Now, can you imagine in those days following that mighty deliverance out of the land of Egypt, can you imagine the excitement can you imagine the thrill of that first night out from under that Egyptian bondage? Can you imagine the thrill that they had when God brought them out of the land of Egypt and brought them down to the Red Sea? And they saw that Red Sea before them and the Bible said they couldn't turn to the right or they couldn't turn to the left. And they heard the, uh, the footsteps of the soldiers of Pharaoh and his chariots and horses coming swiftly behind them and they cried out to Moses and they said, Moses, what are we going to do? And Moses said, we're not going to do anything. Do what? What are we going to do, Moses? Moses said, we're not, we're not going to do anything. He said, we are going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What God started in the land of Egypt, he's going to complete. And you know, as well as I, as the story states, God parted the waters of the Red Sea and the children of Israel passed through on dry land. Can you imagine the rejoicing on the other side as those waters closed up on the army of Pharaoh and destroyed all of those uh, Egyptians that were in pursuit of them? Can you imagine the thrill and the excitement of their deliverance out of the land of Egypt and through the Red Sea? Can you imagine that? Why would a people want to go back to bondage and slavery and oppression? They had just been delivered not long before, and now they're saying we would have been better off if we'd stayed in Egypt. Didn't take them long to get over it, did it? Now, I don't tell you I'm not passing judgment on folks, but I know a lot of folks that claim to know Jesus, but it hadn't took them long to get over it. I just don't believe you can get over it that easy if you ever meet Jesus. Now, you can get religion and it'll wear out in about 30 days. Amen. And a lot of folks are like these, they're like these Israelites. They get in trouble. God hems them up in the corner and, the, and it seems like the world's caving in on them and they'll cry and pray, Oh, 
God, can't you see me down here in all this trouble that I'm in? And God in his grace and God in his mercy will come down and deliver them. But they don't take them long to forget about that. They soon get over it. They soon get over it. The children of Israel, they, they had been delivered out of that bondage. God had heard their cry, seen their affliction, and, and answered their prayers and delivered them out of that Egyptian bondage. And now they've already gotten over the thrill. And they're already talking about going back. Hard to understand, isn't it? They got over it. Can you imagine the thrill of that first Passover? When God told them what that Passover stood for, their deliverance out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine the thrill it was? The passage through the Red Sea and all the excitement and all that, that uh, went along with that. But now, here they are. They said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. They got over it. I pray that we never get over it. I pray that we as a church, and I want to tell you something. I'm not going to give you a history lesson tonight. I reminded us this morning where we were at six and a half years ago, but I want to tell you something. God's been mighty good to us. And I believe that we, like the children of Israel, that uh, the children of Israel had witnessed one miracle right after another in bringing them to this place. And they soon forgot it. And the Lord said, How long ere they believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them? And I want to tell you something tonight. One of the saddest tragedies that could ever happen to Floyd Road Baptist Church is for you and I to get over what God has done for us. For you and I to get over the blessings of God. For you and I to get over. And I want to tell you, some of us have been here for the duration. And some of us have seen God do one miracle right after another. Some of us have seen God do one great thing right behind another. And we've seen God work his will and perform his plan in this place. And the, and the worst thing in the world we can do is get over what God's done for us. In fact, it would be the most dangerous thing. And I've mentioned this morning, it's always a dangerous time. We have a tendency because we're human. But we have a tendency to forget sometimes. And to get over what God has done for us. I can remember coming in this place as, as the Lord has, has blessed and, and has grown and, and blessed the, the work here. And I can remember some of you, and I call you Floyd Road people, you're all Floyd Road people. But when I say Floyd Road people, I'm talking about the people that was here when I come. And I can remember us coming in this in this place and on the weeks and, and the months and then the months began to turn to a year and two years and, and I can remember seeing us on Sunday morning turn around and look back over the congregation with a big smile on your face. I can remember at times when we'd stand to take up the offering I'd say just look around this morning at the people that's in this place. Isn't that a pretty sight? Isn't that a beautiful sight? Y'all remember me making statements like that along the way as God's blessed us and, and what a thrill and what a blessing it was to see God work and move in this place. Folks, we don't need to get over that. We don't need to get over that. And I listen, I want to tell you, I, 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 I want to remind myself of this. If you don't need to be reminded of it, I'm going to remind myself of this tonight. I remember on the first time I walked in this place, that I had a vision of seeing this place full. Every seat in here filled and with a balcony up there filled. And I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to rest and I'm not going to lose sight of that and I'm not going to get satisfied by anything less. In fact, I'm going to keep on praying and I'm going to keep on, on serving until that balcony up there is filled with people. When we get that done, we'll do something else. But I just don't believe that there's any place for us to get over what God has done for us and just accept things as is and say, well, we're pretty comfortable now. You know, uh, the offerings have increased and the attendance have increased and we're getting a few folks saved along and the pretty good attendance in Sunday school and just forget what God's done for us and get over those blessings. You say, preacher, how are we going to continue with the vision, how are we going to continue with a dream and see it come to pass the same way we've saw it come this far? 
just keep on doing what we was doing six and a half years ago. And don't ever get over it. He said, they said, let us return into Egypt. Let us return into Egypt. I made a statement the other day and asked God to forgive me of it just about as soon as I said it. I was talking about a preacher that I'd seen. It was a preacher friend of mine that I'd talked to. And he told me, he said, he said, well, man, I hadn't even had a church member in the hospital in three weeks. And I hadn't even been, I hadn't even been to the hospital in three weeks. And, and I've been, you know, for the last three or four weeks, I mean, we've had, uh, you know, people in the hospital, and I made a statement. I said, boy, I wish I could say that I hadn't been to the hospital in three weeks. And I got to think about that fellow pastor's about 75 people. <laughs> I retracted that statement right quick before the Lord heard it. I don't want to go back to 75. Amen. I'll just shout and go on to the hospitals and, and do what God's called me to do and, and love Jesus and enjoy it like I preached this morning. I, I don't want to get over what God has done. I, I can remember where God's brought me from. And I trust you can. We don't, ever, we don't ever need to get over what God's done for us. But they lost the thrill of that and they lost the excitement of that. And, 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 and it just become commonplace to them. There's a second thing. They not only got over it, but they got used to it. What do you mean they got used to it, preacher? Well, let me give you two or three for instances. At first, they said, why, Moses, we're hungry. We don't have anything to eat. Has God brought us out here in this wilderness to perish of hunger? And Moses interceded to the Lord and said, Lord, these folks are hungry. And the Lord said, no problem. So just tell them to get up in the morning and go out and look on the ground. And you know the story? In the wilderness, God just rained manna down from heaven. And he fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. They said, we're thirsty out here in this dry and barren wilderness. We're thirsty. The Lord said, no problem. I'll give you water to drink. And from the rock, he gave them water to drink. At first... That manna was a miracle. But they got used to it and it was just a meal. At first that water was a wonder. But then it just became water. They got used to it. They took the blessing of God like a lot of us do. When we get something new. We get a new car. We'll wash it three times the first week, once the second week, and then about once the month for about the first six months, and then after that we'll run it through the car wash. You know what happened? We got used to it. The new wore off. The excitement wore off. Can you imagine what they, what they must have felt like when they walked out there on that first day and saw that manna that God had rained down from heaven and, and then saw the water coming forth from that rock that God gave them? Can you imagine the excitement and the thrill of how God had been providing for them in that barren wilderness? They soon got used to it and began to murmur and complain. You remember reading in the Bible about that cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that the Lord used to guide them. But if you look at the extent of those provisions, it goes far beyond just something that God used to guide them. In that dry and barren wilderness, it was nothing in the daytime for the temperature to get up to 100, 110 degrees and get hot. You know what the Lord did right in the middle of that wilderness? He said, I'll just give them some shade. He, them, he gave them a cloud to hover over them, to shade them from the hot sun. And I'm told in that same wilderness that it's nothing for the temperature to drop down that would get up to 110. 
uh, degrees during the daytime that at night it dropped down to 40, 50 degrees and be cold. You know what the Lord said? No problem, I'll just give you a pillow of fire by night to hover over you to keep you warm at night when it's cold. Now, folks, you can't beat the provisions of God, but you know what they did? They got used to it. They got used to it. And it, and it used to be miraculous. And you know what happens when you get used to something? If you're not careful, you'll become ungrateful. And when you, get on, when you become ungrateful, the next thing in, the, in that process is that you begin to murmur and complain. And the things you used to shout about and rejoice over and thank God for, now you complain about. Amen? I don't want to get too personal tonight, but some of you fuss about things you used to shout over. We've got used to it. We've got used to it. We've become ungrateful. It's a danger sign in a church when you get over it. There's a danger sign in a church when you get used to it. And it becomes commonplace. And you become ungrateful and unthankful. Here was the people that went out and rejoiced and thanked God for that manna when they first ate that manna. And then they got tired of that manna. And they was wanting something else. God gave them quail to the full, as you well know. Gave them flesh to eat. They complained when they become ungrateful. I don't want to go to heaven complaining to you. You know, a lot of Christians have got to the place to where they used to rejoice and be excited about serving Jesus and loving Jesus, and now they look like that the Lord's got them by the hair of the head and he's dragging them every step of the way, saying, come on, you're going where you want to or not. And they complain. I want to tell you, I don't intend to go to heaven that way. I want to go to heaven with a little joy in my soul. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to get over it, and I don't want to get used to it. And I don't want to take it for granted. And I just want to tell you now, if me and Sister Bailey are the only two left around here, I'm going to shout it out till Jesus comes. Amen? I'm not going to get over it. I'm not going to get used to it. I'm not going to take it for granted. I'm not going to sit around and murmur and complain. I'm going to love Jesus. I want to serve him. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. I think it's good sometimes that God rolls the curtain back and reminds us where we've been. Let's us see where, where we've been, where he's brought us from, and where he's brought us to. And I thank God for his blessings. I don't want to get over it, and I don't want to get used to it. But there's something else that happened that I believe that's behind let us return, and that is they forgot it. You say, preacher, now what? How do you arrive that they, that they forgot it? Well, they said, let us make us a captain and let us return into Egypt. To where? Had they forgotten what was back in Egypt? Had they so soon forgotten those taskmakers down there? Had they so soon forgotten that slavery and bondage that they were in under Pharaoh and his taskmakers? Had they forgotten that? They were wanting to go back to that? I want to ask you something tonight. If you're here as a Christian, and the devil is tempting you, and the devil is has got you beat down and defeated and discouraged, and you're thinking about just throwing your hands up and quit and going back, I want to ask you something. What are you going to go back to? Back to bondage? Back to slavery? What are you going to go back to? Have you forgotten where you were at when the Lord found you? Have you forgotten the condition you were in when Jesus found you? They had forgotten. 
the pain and suffering affliction that they were in down in Egypt. Why else would they be talking about going back? Why else would they even consider going back had they not forgotten? You know what we do sometimes? We forget where God brought us from. Now we may not, we may not consciously and willfully confess and admit that we have forgotten what God has done for us and where God's brought us from, but our actions prove otherwise. That we have forgotten where God has brought us from. I don't want to go back. I don't know about you, I don't want to go back. I don't want to get used to it, and I don't want to get over it. But when God brought them out, here's God's intentions for them. Well, I thought I was going to share it with you. What his intentions were. I've got a new Bible, and I can't get used to it. And I can't remember where that verse is at. I had it marked on the page of my old Bible. I don't have it marked on my new one. But anyway, I can quote it to you. Or I can give you the paraphrase edition of it. God brought them out of Egypt, not just to get them out of bondage, but God brought them out to bring them in to the land of Canaan. God didn't, he didn't bring them out of bondage just to set them free from that bondage and slavery they were under, but to give them something far better, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And I'll tell you how easy it is to get over it, get used to it, and forget it, is when you just get out, but you don't go on to where God wants to bring you. And you get content with just being out. You get content with just being free, so to speak, from the bondage that you fall short of going on. It's like a little boy kept falling out of the bed. Every time he'd fall out of the bed, his mother would go in there and get him, and finally she said, Johnny, she said, why do you keep falling out of the bed? He said, well, Mom, I guess I just go to sleep too close to where I get in, where I got in at. You know why many of a Christian keeps falling out? They go to sleep and sit down too close to where they got in at. God didn't just save you to keep you out of hell, but he saved you to take you somewhere. Amen. To a land of victory, to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And not just when we get to heaven, but before we get to heaven. The Lord didn't save you just to exist and just to say, well, I'm not going to hell, but I'm going to be in torment and misery while I'm here. No, the Lord saved you for your life to count for him. I don't want to forget where I've been. I don't want to forget what God's done for me. And I pray tonight, on this last Sunday night of 1991, that you and I as a church will not be guilty of getting over what God's done for us. That we will not be guilty of getting used to what God has done for us and that we certainly will not forget what God has done for us but that we will go on I'm praying for God to stir this place and shake this place and send us revival in our hearts and and uh, cause us to remember where we've been and to remember what God has done for us. I want to live this coming year with a grateful heart of gratitude and praise and honor unto the Lord. I said this morning that I love him more than I did the first Sunday of this year. I want that love to continue to grow and my relationship as a Christian to continue to grow. Do you know how I can be a better pastor to you in this coming year than I've been in this past year? is to be a better Christian. If I improve my relationship with, with Jesus, I can't help but be a better preacher and a better pastor. It's just that simple. And that's where the priority of every one of us ought to be as church members. 
Well, our priority ought to be our relationship with Jesus Christ. You get that relationship with Jesus Christ right, everything else will be right. Amen? It'll be right. Now, I've done, made up my mind a long time ago. I, I beat my head against the wall for years trying to get folks to get their relationship to the work right. Try to push them and pump them and motivate them and, and get them, you know, to do the work of God. And I'm going to tell you the conclusion I've come to in the last few years. If you get a person's relationship with Jesus, right, you don't have to worry about his position and his place of service. You don't ever have to worry about pushing on him, pulling on him, getting him to do the right thing. You don't have to push on folks and pull folks to get them to come to church. Their relationship with Jesus is right. That's the key to it, folks. That is the very foundation of it. But when you get over it and get used to it, you'll soon forget it. May our relationship to him be all that it should be and all that it needs to be for his own honor and for his own glory. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. I wonder tonight, are you a Christian in this place? Have you gotten over what God's done for you? Have you got used to it? Have you forgotten where God's brought you from? If so, you ought to purpose in your heart tonight that you're going to take the scales from off your eyes. You're going to see again what God's really done for you. And say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to get over it. I'm not going to get used to it, and I'm not going to forget it, but I'm going to live every day of this coming year with a heart of gratitude and praise to God for what he's done for me. I want to challenge your heart to do that tonight if you're here in this building and you're saved. If you're here in this building tonight and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, if you were to die right where you sit tonight, and you have no hope of heaven. I want to urge you tonight to see the urgency of your spiritual condition before God. And I trust that before this service is over tonight, that you'll leave your seat and walk down one of these aisles and give your heart and life to Jesus. Say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm opening the door of my heart and I'm inviting you in to become my Lord and Savior. If you need Jesus tonight, I urge you to do that in a moment when we stand the same. Father, take the message. Lord, may it challenge our hearts. Oh God, help us never be ungrateful. Help us not to get over it and to get used to it. And certainly not to forget what you've done for us. Lord, help us to live with a heart of gratitude and praise and appreciation for who you are and what you've done for us, where you brought us from and where you're taking us to. Lord, I pray for those that may be here in this building tonight that have no hope of heaven, that have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. May they come tonight and may they trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we'll thank you for it because we've asked it in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen and amen.